Welcome to Aquarium Dog. Subscribe, like, and comment. Hope you enjoy the show. Hi, I'm back here another video about fish and that's it. Hello, I'm Mr. Fish. Hello, I'm Mr. Fish. Hey, what's up guys? So I said you were going to meet some of my good friends, really close friends and associates. And this is more than just a friend to me. His name is Dominic and he's an, a world famous dog man. Hey guys, I'm Dominic. We're about to go right here to Aquarium and Pets and get a couple of rats and mice to feed my snakes. They quite frankly haven't eaten in, in quite a while. They're a little overdue. Uh, they've been burn mating over the winter, which is a period that's sort of like a hibernation where they don't feed because the temperature drops a little bit. And now that the spring is here, it's time to start feeding the snakes again. So it should be a fun clip. Normally I breed my own right, mice and rats, but I haven't been doing it this year. So I'm at the local pet shop purchasing them. So we're back in the car. We got our uh, feed. We got our feed is, we got show, fish, show, we show, got... show us what you got. This oh. is for some. This is for some garter snakes. What others? And then these are uh, some feeder goldfish, which actually you cannot feed regularly because they will develop the, the snake will develop a vitamin B deficiency from this variety of fish. You have to be careful what kind of fish you feed to your snake, but that only happens if you feed repeatedly. Uh, generally, I'll feed frozen tilapia or flounder or very white fish, but not oily fish because they get a uh, B vitamin deficiency, which causes eventually a neurological problem. But to feed once in a while, occasionally, it's not a problem. These are rats and mice too. So let's see, we're gonna have some fun, I think. So Dom, what made you get into reptiles? Or have you always been into reptiles? What did you get into first? I loved all kinds of animals in science and biology ever since I was a little kid. I, I just loved animals and reptiles in particular. You know, I kind of was a spin-off. You know how like a lot of young boys are into dinosaurs? Well, I think it was a spin-off of that because as soon as I kind of realized that I was never going to really see dinosaurs, I kind of realized that reptiles were the closest living thing that I would ever encounter to dinosaurs. And then my affinity and my interest, my childish interest in dinosaurs kind of flowed over to reptiles. And I used to fantasize about having all different kinds of snakes. And back then we didn't have any internet or anything. So everything was through books, you know, you saw pictures of it and it was hard to get a lot of information like it is today. It's a lot, it's easy, you just Google stuff and you see YouTube videos and you see tons of photographs and images. You know, when we were a kid, just a few glimpses, a few images of rare reptiles and snakes were all you got to see. As a matter of fact, one of those favorite snakes that I always wanted when I was a little kid was the Western hognose snake. It looked really cool. It had a flat head and its nose was turned up. And its nose was turned up just as its name indicates, hog nose snake. And that's because it has a, a habit of burrowing in sand and it was primarily a toad eater. But back then I got a Western hog nose snake, but it was very difficult to get it to feed because they weren't very domesticated. There were no real captive bred specimens and it was hard to get a supply of toads. As a matter of fact, when I bought it at the pet shop, the guy never even told me that it ate toads. Um, but today, uh, Western hognose snakes are much more readily to feed on mice and rodents because they've been bred in captivity and that's been the food that's been provided for many generations now. As a matter of fact, I have one and we're about to go see it. And just for that matter, just to bring up, you know, the, the fact that before buying any animal, you should look into it a little bit, do some research. You need to do some research because like I said, there's a lot more, and research is easier to do today. Uh, there's a lot more information available online. When I was a kid, it was really difficult, and actually a lot of the information uh, was wrong because, um, you know, even the zoos, if a snake laid an egg, they had no idea how it happened, you know. Um, the zoos never even really reproduced their own animals because the animals were relatively inexpensive and if something died, if a python died or something in the, sh in the snake display at the local zoo, they would just order another one from Africa or from Indonesia, wherever it came from. 
Um, things are quite different today. The reptile, the pet reptile industry and the reptile breeding industry and hobby is actually quite huge today. And there's a ton more information. Today, uh, kind of like technologies, you have 13 year old kids breeding pythons in their bedroom and they have dozens of them and they have all kinds of complicated breeding programs going on. Uh, you know, a generation ago that was unheard of. Zoologists couldn't even do that. Never mind a 13 year old kid in his bedroom. All right, so come on, guys. Let's go inside and let's check out these snakes. Let's do it. And this is my wife, Jen. You're real. You're joking right now, right? Doing all the fucking dishes because no one in my house does a dish or anything. I'm too busy feeding the snakes. Yeah. This is me. I'm not the wife. I'm the maid and the kennel help. I'm not the wife. Wife gets her nails done, her hair done, clothes, all kinds of things. Not me. Oh, God. Oh, God. Not me. Oh, God. Okay, just like I promised, the first snake I'm going to bring out and show is uh, the Western hognose snake. Oh, a little feisty. Probably hungry. A little pissed off but here she is this is a female she'll calm down in a minute probably very hungry and feisty but you could see the shelf shovel face shaped nose like I promised you you see right there and the flat head the hissing is really just a bluff they rarely to ever bite and uh, I'm gonna prepare a mouse for this snake. These snakes do not constrict their food, which means they don't strangle it. Um, they eat it whole. And mice are really not, like I said, it's native food, it's indigenous food, but um, they've been adapted to eat it. She seems like she's in a really nasty mood. She hasn't been handled all winter, so she's kind of mean right now. She normally doesn't piss off this bad. She's an albino, which means that all the pigment, all the black pigments have been taken out of uh, the snake through uh, genetic through selection. Look, she's... It's a king cobra rattlesnake, right? She's Poisoning. hissing a lot of... No, actually it's not. She's doing a lot of hissing. Smart snake. Bring out the snakes that are the size of your snakes. You know, the really, really big ones, the size of your snake. Oh, there they are. Those are them. The garter snakes? Yeah, the, real, the ones that are the size of your snake. Right they, there. There's yeah, a whole variety yeah. of garter snakes in there. They're all uh, different morph colors of t radix Iowa plane. I think they got the garter. Irish curse, the garter snakes. They got the Irish curse. <laughs> I think you got the I think you got the Irish curse. I do. I have a a fresh mouse here. He's been stunned. And uh, we're gonna try to see if this girl's interested in eating. Sometimes it takes a minute to get him to go back on feed. Doesn't appear she's ready to start eating it. Oh nope, it doesn't appear she's ready to start eating it. I'll try again in a couple days. So her temperature has just been brought up to normal, which is 82 degrees, which is the ideal temperature to keep them at. But I guess she hasn't been warm long enough yet to uh, accept the food. Generally, garter snakes are more cold tolerant, and they're also quicker to come out of the uh, formation period that the winter naturally provides. And I'm gonna provide these live feeders, which usually is particularly enticing for them. These are T. radix Iowa Plains garter snakes, and I have several varieties here. This first one is in a uh, anathristic female, which really basically is all almost all black with a little bit of purple use. Some of this is just her skin coming off. Here's a high red albino T. radix, 
This is the normal coloring of the T-Radix. This is an adult female. This is about how big they get fully grown. I have another adult in here as well as one other very small male, young male, which I I hatched out myself last year. These snakes, they, uh, they bear live young. And uh, here you got a variety, a rainbow of colors of T. radix. Iowa Plains gar garter snakes. Let's see if anybody is interested in eating. Is that she prefers to drink some water right now. I have a feeling this guy won't disappoint us. This is a very aggressive feeder in general. This is a large male Florida Brooks King Snake. And uh, I'm gonna feed him a live medium rat. There you go. Okay, this should be high action, high intensity. Here's our rat. Here's our king snake. Well, I still think maybe the uh, the temperature is still not quite as aggressive as his normal feeding response. But as I told you, I had a feeling he would not disappoint us. These snakes are constrictors, which means they strangle their prey. Actually, they don't strangle the prey. What they do is they wrap tight coils around the prey, and each time the prey lets out a breath, it tightens a little bit more. So it's not actually strangling around the neck. What it's actually doing is it's constricting the ability of the prey animal to breathe. See the garter snake here has fished out a live feeder. This is the first one of the season to fish out a feeder there. And uh, you see that they don't constrict the prey like the king snakes that you just watched. Instead, they just grab them and wrestle them down the hole. And garter snakes will pretty much eat anything, fish, frogs, earthworms, small rodents, birds, anything they can consume and they can fit in their mouth. They've even been known to have been observed in the wild eating roadkill. This crazy snake is still on the leg. He hasn't straightened himself out. I don't think he's going to be successful, but he's pretty damn hungry, having not eaten in about 60 days. I still have this mouse, which was refused by the hognose snake a little earlier. In here is a really nice albino California king snake, lavender that I bred myself. I had both the parents and I hatched this baby from an egg and it was a hold back that I kept. She's usually a very voracious eater and I'm gonna see right now. There you go. It's a very hearty appetite snake. This snake here is rattling her tail at me, um, which is a sign of aggression. I noticed that all the snakes seem to be a little more agitated than normal after several months of not being handled or, or touched by humans and in being in a very quiet environment. But here you see this snake has grabbed the, the mouse appropriately by the head and is having a much easier time consuming the uh, relatively large prey in comparison to the size of the snake. Um, it's important to not to feed them super large prey. I, I have an idea um, from past previous feedings um, what these snakes can handle but if you feed them an excessively large prey item they have a chance to regurgitate the prey and once they start regurgitating their feed sometimes that can become a chronic condition so we try to prevent that here we got <clears throat> here we have um, two forms of milk snake this one actually right here is half bread it's a mix between a milk snake and a corn snake really crazy whacking out a mouse and here we got his little cage mate here a Honduran milk snake also eagerly gobbling up their first meal of the season
Hey, in future episodes, we might be including some things about dogs. As a matter of fact, we might have a mishap in tape training a police dog with my good friend, Shane. So here's a little teaser. There is no better than that. There is no better in the world. They say in the United States, I say in the world. There's no better than him. You train your dog. No matter what you need done. But they're both they're both devastating spots. Look, like the Germans and most most minimal apprehension dogs. Like you could do like something more over here. Well, you could, but you think, and when you feel that kind of pressure on your being wrong, you'd right. be surprised how much that'll bring you down. No, of course. But the Dutch tend to take it a step further and make the dog attack the most vulnerable areas. In here, in your armpit. That's bad. You're right? It's really soft tissue. And then behind your leg, right here. What I tell you. What? Ready? Good boy! Brava! 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 Ha! Good! Brava! 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 Lean it back like that so you can get it. Brava! 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 Do it again, do it again. Brava! 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 Okay, now you stand still, you ready? He's gonna be with Casper! Lose! Let me see. I don't know. Show me. Right. Show me. It's bad. I don't know. Show me. Show me. It's bad. Show me. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> Come on. Okay. Then, little ice. Little yeah. ice for the swelling. Mama Donovan told me. Yeah. To put a little ice. Leave some I want them to come to <laughs> Stony Brook. Where's Demo? Let's take Demo out. It's been a pleasure hanging out with Dom today. We'll be back. I said I had some crazy friends. He's one of them. He's also very cool though. He's one of my closest friends. See you later. <laughs>